joining us on another live streaming chat. Today I'm going to be talking with the amazing, the wonderful Stephen Reddy. And uh, Stephen uh, will take your questions. He's going to answer questions and he's going to do a demo, which is going to be really exciting. Um, so I'll just read you a little bit about Stephen's bio in case you're unfamiliar with Stephen. Stephen Reddy currently teaches drawing and illustration at Gage Academy in Seattle. And he's an active member of Urban Sketchers for many years. Um, and he's published several illustrated memoirs. So uh, his first book was called Everyday Sketching and Drawing. And uh, since then, he's also um, published uh, an illustrated memoir in 2015 called Now Where Was I? And also in 2015, uh, this, was this Was Then, That Was Now. And in 2017, Perfect World. And in 2018, oh, I guess I have the wrong order. This one came out in 2018, Everyday Sketching and Drawing. And in 2019, another one called About a Year. And in this year, he just recently, in the last month, I think, he's um, published another one called Yeep Leap Year Journal. So, uh, welcome, Stephen. Let's see if we can get you in the call. There he is. Hi, Stephen. Hello, everybody. Uh, I want to thank Brenda for inviting me to this as a teacher, uh, not being able to have students in front of me and go to my classes. Uh, it's been very isolating. So I'm thrilled to be able to share my, my passion for uh, sketchbook journaling. Thank you. So I'm really excited that you agreed to chat with us. And oh my gosh, you, you are a prolific writer and illustrator. I can't believe you just are just, these are just come pouring off at the end of your pen. Well, since I draw every day, it seems like about once a year, I've accumulated enough drawings to uh, put into a book. And so it's been about a book a year. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, I, I hope that you'll tell us about your books um, as we go along. Did you want to talk about your books first? Or you want to look at some of your sketches first? Uh, well, I think it'll be easier to just kind of annotate the slides as we go through. But I do want to say that the purpose of this chat is I have a, a very strong passion for journaling for uh, personal memoir, uh, illustrated memoirs. And my impetus for getting started goes all the way back to high school when a friend of mine lent me his person, basically his diary, but it was all illustrated and it had clippings from plays that he was in and cards that people had given him and uh, his own drawings. And it was just so inspiring and it was so such an intimate act for him to hand me his personal uh, journal that uh, I immediately went out and bought my own and I've been journaling every day since. And so, uh, you know, I have a kind of a selfish reason for promoting sketchbook journaling is I want to look at everybody else's journal. So when I go to a bookstore, some of the books that are the most interesting to me are not the edited and, and fine-tuned finished versions of books, but the, the, you know, the personal books that weren't really meant for mass consumption, but that's where you get the nitty gritty and you get to see the real thoughts and ideas of the artist. Uh, and that's where, that's what gets me excited. And so that's what I try to share in my books is not just finished drawings, but the, the thoughts and the ideas and the stages that lead up to those drawings. Cool. That's really exciting. So Stephen, do you have, um, other uh, urban sketchers or artists that are particularly inspirational for you? Sure. Uh, Le Pan uh, is an a artist who is very prolific, very similar to me in that he's uh, constantly self-publishing, sometimes professionally publishing uh, his work. Um, and he's very active on urban sketchers. Paul Heaston, a lot of you are probably familiar with his work. Uh, I got to know Paul through Craftsy when I uh, went down to Denver to record my two Craftsy classes. Uh, he's also a very prolific uh, sketchbooker and uh, hatching artist, which I do yeah. some hatching as well in my work. Um, Tommy Kane, I really like Tommy Kane's work. I've uh, had the opportunity to sketch with him several times. He and Gabby Campanario and I have met with the urban sketchers here in Seattle. Uh, and so it's really fun for the same reason that I'm interested in people's personal sketchbook journals to be able to sit with other artists and look over their shoulder while they're working or even afterwards we might go to a coffee shop and flip through each other's sketchbooks and that's really exciting too to be able to see the actual uh, thing and hold it in your hands. It's really cool when you can hold someone else's sketchbook in your hands and you just oh yeah it's like you know you feel like this this is so valuable you're, you're like oh I don't want to gotta go wash my hands and make sure. Yeah well the first thing I do when I finish a drawing is uh, do a very high resolution scan 
uh, so that if anything were to happen to the sketchbooks, and often people, like I'm drawing houses in my neighborhood now, and people will contact me and say, hey, that's my house, can I buy that sketch? Yeah. And I don't have to worry about a future publication because I've already got a nice quality scan of it, so I can go ahead and give them the original. Yeah, um, cool. All right, well, let's uh, have a look at your sketches. I'm really sure. excited to be showing them. Uh, just and if I tend to go on and on, just cut me off because I am very passionate about it and I have a lot to say and, and I've been teaching my classes for a while. So I've kind of got uh, a memory of the, the points that I like to make. So just scoot me along if you need to. Okay. All right. All right. I'm excited. Oh my goodness. Have a look at this, you guys. Is that amazing? Gorgeous sketch. Okay, I'm going so this to... Is a guitar, this is a guitar shop in Pioneer Square. I'm always keeping my eye open for uh, potential subjects for drawings. And I bought myself a guitar on my uh, birthday a couple of years ago. And when I was in there, I peeked into the, uh, the back room where they do their work and asked them if I could, could do a drawing of their shop. I love this kind of uh, unstaged clutter. And, and lots of detail. And so this was a really fun, fun drawing. I've done other uh, guitar shops since this one. Wow. And I'm just looking at that one grid in the background that's got little cubby holes in it and you've got this perfect, <laughs> you, you captured it perfectly with the right angles. Good for you. Know, you. it's interesting that you say that because I don't think of perspective when I draw. Right. I'm not drawing horizon lines or vanishing points or any construction lines at all. As a matter of fact, I do, very little pencil and zero erasing. I don't allow myself to uh, erase and redraw a line because I want to capture that immediacy. And I also don't want to spend more than a couple hours on a drawing. So I find that if I have very strict rules, then it just, it keeps me on point and I'm able to do at least a drawing a day yeah. like this. I remember you talked to me about, uh, about perspective and not caring so much about getting the exact vanishing points and horizon line and all those things. And I think that it is possible to sketch without paying any attention to that at all, even though I, I teach perspective myself. <laughs> but I think it is possible to not think about it if you are able to flatten what you see in front of you in your own mind, if you're able to flatten that 3D thing into a 2D thing and you're just filling in the parts like um, like a stained glass window, and you can exactly. capture it. Now, I do, I do understand perspective, and I, I understand how it works. So I may be subconsciously applying some of those rules, but you're absolutely right. The old masters sometimes would create a frame and then put a screen in it so you have the little squares, and then you could see your scene as a 2D image and just transfer it one square at a time to the paper. So you're not using any perspective rules at all. So I think there's no. some a, a similar process to that going on, although I'm not actually holding up the screen. No. Yeah, you're doing it in your head. That, that's really yeah. great. And we have our first question from Karen Moore. She's saying, uh, on your shelf in, behind you, uh, in, oh. not in the sketch, in real life, yeah. Um, there are a lot of handmade books. Do you make your own sketchbooks and journals? That's a great question. I, I buy them. They're typical books with the spiral binding. But I find that when I try to scan my work, it won't lay flat on the platen, the glass uh, screen. There'll be a little bit like an inch wide that's out of focus because the binding is keeping it off of the glass. So the first thing I do when I buy a sketchbook is just literally pull that off. It's not a literal spiral, so you don't have to unwind it. You can just pull it right off. And then I replace it with these one inch bindery rings. And that makes it really easy to sort my work. I can pull a page out without tearing the perforations. Uh, scan it flat in the scanner and then put it back. It also lets me organize my books. I've got some that are all still lifes, some that are graphic novel uh, entries, uh, interiors, exteriors. You can organize your sketchbooks however you like if you just get rid of that spiral binding. Great question. Wow, that is a good question. Um, I have a question about your sketching style. So there's, they're so charming, so lovely, so wonderful. Um, and uh, and I, I, what I see is it's, everything is slightly, I don't know how to say it, slightly fatter, slightly rounded, a little bit puffed out. And that gives it this really beautiful, charming style. Um, obviously, that's deliberate. My artwork has often been described as chubby. And, yes. uh, and, 
I, I like that description. It, it could be, you know, I grew up on Saturday morning cartoons, like a lot of people of my generation. Uh, and so when I'm looking at shapes, I tend to see a basic underlying geometry. So I'm looking at spheres, cones, cylinders, cubes, things like that. So if the object that I'm drawing doesn't actually have that shape, it sort of gets pushed into those shapes because when you've got an overwhelming amount of detail like this, it's yeah. easier for me to just see this as just a bunch of solids, a bunch of geometric solids. And, uh, and so you'll see there's a lot of cylinders and cubes and cones and things like that. And I think that's what kind of forces all of the objects, regardless of their natural shape, into these really basic uh, platonic ideals. Cool, that's very cool. I um, have another question for you from uh, Stephen Howe, Stephen Howes. And Stephen is asking, uh, do you complete the whole image on location or finish in the studio like Tom Tommy Kane sometimes does? Yeah, actually, Gabby, most of us do this because uh, we're limited by time. And also, it can be unwieldy on location to manage watercolors and brushes and water for rinsing. And so very often, the color is done at home. But I do all of the line work and uh, very often most of the ink washes on location. I, I really don't enjoy drawing from photographs because a photograph has done a lot of the decision making for you. It's already framed your scene, it's already flattened everything out. Sometimes things will be in shadow and it just gets so dark you can't really see what's going on in there. But in real life, your pupils will dilate and, and expand to let in more light. And you can actually go up to objects, handle them, look around to see how things are constructed. It's just much, and also sketching for me is about being present in the moment in a certain location. I do not like sitting in front of a computer all day long. And so the whole point for me uh, behind urban sketching is to get out of the apartment, to get out into my environment. And so a uh, great question, all of the line work and most of the ink washers are done on location, but just for convenience, I will uh, do the color uh, at home, unless I'm teaching a class and I'm doing a demo where people want to see it by, then I will do the whole thing uh, on the scene. Cool. And another question for you from Karen Moore again. What, um, uh, what kind of sketchbooks do you prefer? Oh, well, I use all kinds. If I'm on the bus or if I'm going to be in a coffee shop, I can use a really small uh, sketchbook like this. This is my, my bus book, which literally is what I sketch on the bus when I'm commuting. But my preferred sketchbook is the one I showed earlier. It's the Canson, my, it's kind of obscured by stickers, but it's the Canson Montball 9 by 12 field book or art book. Uh, I like these because the paper is a combination of watercolor paper, which can be too fibrous if you're trying, it's not designed to be drawn with a, a ballpoint pen, which is what I use. Um, and so it can pull up the fibers and your pen can kind of stutter across the surface. But Bristol paper is not absorbent enough for the several layers of ink wash and watercolor. So this Canson Montball is a really nice hybrid, kind of a cross between watercolor and drawing paper. Can you Very say, absorbent. Could you say the second word again? Canson, the Canson. Canson Montball, M-O-N-T-V-A-L. Canson Montball. Here, I might have one that's not. Uh, I've obscure. never heard of that. I've never heard of that brand. Here you go. Here's a better. This is what they look like. Okay. Montval. Hmm. Never heard of that one. Cool. Yeah, I buy them a dozen at a time. I'm, I'm terrified that my favorite materials will be uh, discontinued or they'll stop stocking. So I just go and buy a dozen at a time. And yeah. uh, if you're in Seattle, I ask artists and craftsmen to stock these specifically for my students. So you can do special orders as well. Canson Montball 9 by 12. Cool. Excellent. All right. So I have several more questions. Let's just hold off on the questions for a minute so we can see your art. Yeah, I might answer some of these questions as we go through the slides. Yeah. Okay. Tell us about this slide. So these I put in there just to show the origins. These are high school and college uh, sketchbooks. Back then I was using um, just the, you know, the really low grade books that you can get for just a few bucks. The paper is not very good. It's not very absorbent. So when you try to watercolor, it gets all wrinkly. But that's what I started out with because I had no expectations that anybody would ever see my, my journals or my sketchbooks. I just did it for myself. So 
these are, you know, these show my, my college dorm room plans, some sketches of Neil Young, because I was a big fan. In the top right is my first urban sketch of a Russian Orthodox church in Oakland, California. Uh, bottom right is just diary pages of things that was uh, going on in my life. So again, it was just developing that sketchbook habit without any thought that someday they would be published or seen by others. It was just uh, important to me to keep up the habit. Right. Cool. And then uh, I became a teacher and didn't really focus on my sketchbooks for a long time until I found out about the Gage Art Academy. And I decided I wanted to learn how to oil paint as the, as the original old masters did. And so these were a couple of my first oil paintings. Um, the one on the right is called A Day in the Life. It just shows my shower in the morning and my hot cup of cocoa and my car and sketching and my breakfast and, and things like that. Um, but that's where I learned my technique, even though this is oil, the old masters would complete the entire painting in monochrome, an umber or gray, and then glaze the color in very thin layers on the top. Okay. And then all that underpainting would show through. So when I started oil paint, I mean, uh, watercolor painting, I realized, oh, the same technique could work with an ink wash base rather than paint. And then instead of glazing oil paint on top, you can put your watercolor in thin layers on top. And it works exactly the same. I was surprised to not be able to find other artists who did this technique because it seemed like a natural progression from, from the oil painting tradition, but it works great. Yeah. Well, looking at your demo, um, I, I realize you are doing things really differently from what I've seen other people do. And I'm really excited for people to see your demo. It's going to be so cool. So that's, that's one advantage about being self-taught is you don't know you're doing it wrong. <laughs> well, I, I'm not saying wrong. I'm not saying wrong. Well, no, I'm just I, saying. I'm saying that facetiously because sometimes doing it wrong gives you a result that is unique and different from what everybody else is doing. It's true. It's true. Cool. Well, I mentioned that I became a teacher when my son was born. I got very into uh, uh, early childhood development and I took some classes and I just realized, oh, I think uh, teaching might suit me. And so this is the school uh, where I had my own fourth and fifth grade classroom for 13 years. Wow. Cool. Very cool. All right. Let's ask a question here. Um, um, Sue now says, she says that she has several of your books and she took your arts, uh, artsy class. Um, she, she wants to know if you use prompts or other things to help you get to help you get through your idea slumps when you're keeping a daily journal, especially in our quarantine times when we are isolated. That's a terrific question. As a matter of fact, I just started teaching a class at the Gage. It was all about keeping up the sketchbook habit. It wasn't really a technique class. And that goes right to the heart of what I'm passionate about is you're always somewhere. If you open your eyes, there's something in front of you. You might think, oh, that's not gonna make a very interesting drawing. But the fact that it's a drawing is what makes it interesting. Uh, something I remind my students that you can't improve on mother nature. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time drawing landscapes and flower arrangements and things like that because I, I can't do them justice. But I can take a pile of clutter on my desk or you know, the mess over by the laundry uh, hamper or you know, just looking out my window, there's always something in front of you. And if you think about the drawing process as, about, as a process rather than coming up with a finished, beautiful work of art, then there's really nothing to stop you from drawing. I might open the newspaper and draw from the obituary uh, photographs. I might draw a comic diary of a memory that I had or illustrate a dream or go through my old sketchbooks and redraw a scene that now that I've had some experience, I might think, oh, I could do that better now. Um, just flipping through old photographs. I've got a shoebox of old photos that sometimes I'll pull out. Uh, look at other people's work. It's, it's amazing to me, once you get into the habit, there's really no excuse not to draw because if you open your eyes, there's something to draw. Yeah, cool. Let's, let's, uh, let's get another question in here. Um, Claire Putnam is uh, saying, how long does it take you to complete a sketch like the one that just you, we just showed of that very busy shop? And um, she also says uh, that you said that you never use pencils or erasers, but she's, she's guessing that you did when you were a beginner artist. Oh, yes, of course. Um, 
Yeah, and probably the reason I can do very little pencil now is because I'm kind of doing that layer in, in my mind as I'm inking. Because the thing is, drawing with ink, I can't erase. And so yeah. I have to start with the most foreground object and draw that first, and then whatever's behind that, and so on. And every drawing, that every part of the drawing that I finish becomes a reference point for the position of everything else in the scene. So there is no erasing possible. And at first, I was worried about that because, oh, this is inaccurate, this line isn't straight, that egg doesn't look very egg-shaped. But then I realized as long as you approach the entire drawing with the same attitude and you're making the same kind of distortions or inaccuracies throughout, then it coheres, it unifies the drawing because that's yeah. the style of the drawing. Yeah. I don't try to cultivate a style. I just draw quickly with ink and that's what I get. Yeah. And, and of course, the more you do it, the more... Um, the more refined your work looks because you, you know, you develop a, a technique or a habit. Yeah. I'm not sure if you answered the first part of the question was how long oh. did it take you to complete that oh. sketch of the busy shop? Great. Uh, you know, I really encourage you to sketch with the urban sketchers. Every, every major city and many minor cities have a chapter of the urban sketchers. And if you join them, they're only going to spend two and a half hours at a location. And yeah. by doing that repeatedly, it teaches you to budget your time. If I only had two and a half hours, and that's going to give me, uh, you know, a minute or two to do a very quick pencil blocking out, and then I've got maybe 45 minutes for my ink lines, I've got another 45 minutes for my ink washes, and then pretty soon you're out of time and that's it. And the more you do that, the more you kind of have an intuitive sense of how long you're going to get to spend. So I, I like that two or three hour window. My classes are two or three hours. Now on a really big drawing like that one you saw at the guitar shop um, that was actually on a like a poster size piece of paper and so that one i did probably spend more like four or five hours on that's much more detailed and, and more involved than my typical drawings but i'd say two hours for a typical drawing yeah nine cool. by twelve yeah cool all right let's have another look here so this is a second grade classroom i was a substitute and while the kids went to lunch and lunch recess, I realized I'd have about an hour. And so this one did not go to color. I didn't have time and I didn't have a photo reference later to complete it in color. But a lot of my drawings, I'm satisfied with them at this stage. And so this just shows the, the ink wash. So even if it was to go to color, it would go through this stage. All my color drawings are developed to this level of completion before the color is then glazed on uh, in very thin layers on top. That's but so even cool. here, you can see the basic geometry. If you look, it's just spheres and cubes, the, the cylind cylindrical map hanging on the board in the background. It's really just trying to see a complicated scene as a series of basic structures. And shapes, yeah. Yeah. Cool, yeah. Okay, and here's the steps, the process right. as you right. add your layers. Right, so you can see I took photos as I went along. The top left is just the contour lines done with a uniball pen. Top right is the first layer of ink wash that is done not because I'm putting in darks, I'm trying to isolate the highlights. So basically I'm washing everything in the picture except where I see pure white or a shiny reflection or a highlight. So that helps me think of, you know, I wanna have a high contrast drawing in the end. And one thing to do that is to make sure that the whites pop out and they, they look shiny and reflective. The second layer at the bottom left is now I'm looking at shadows and dark areas. And then the bottom right, the final layers where I'm really hitting the, the, uh, the shadows and the crevices and the concavities and making sure that those are nice and dark. Yeah, so these are many layers and ma many shades of gray. Do you ever, I'm not sure, well, I, I saw the front of one of your books, uh, but do you, in your sketches like this, do you ever get all the way down to black? No, because it's a very linear technique. The line work and the hash mar hatch marks are part of the technique. And if I were to use solid black, it would obscure the contours. It would just be a big black bat. Now, some of my books, I do only work in black and white. Like the book Perfect World is almost yeah. entirely done with just pure ink and brushes. It's a more comic book kind of a style. But these ink wash ones, I don't go to solid black because I want my line work to show. Okay, cool. So a question from uh, Lydia Villard. Hi, hi Lydia. Um, she's asking, um, 
that if you remove pages from your sketchbook, he, it says, she says, he said he sold a house drawing and kept the scan for himself. So do you remove right. pages from your sketchbook? Yes, and that's the, maybe you came in after I uh, talked about if you replace the spiral binding with these rings, you can take drawings out and you don't have to tear you don't have to tear the perforations here. So I just, if somebody buys the drawing, I just give them the whole thing. And then I assume when they have it framed or matted that they'll cover up the, uh, the perforations. It's so smart, such a great idea. Wow, and here's another example, but with the color added. Right, so same thing. Uh, this one shows the initial three ink wash layers first. And then I apply the color the same way, also in basically three layers. If you know about process, color printing. You've got cyan, magenta, and yellow. I sort of apply my watercolor layers the same way. So in the top right, you can see it's a layer of my yellows. Bottom left, I've started to put in some reds on the flowers and the chimney, and then some blue on the bottom right. I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but the house in the background, and there's a little bit of a blue tinting to the shadows. So I'm trying as hard as I can to keep this a very structured uh, method. So I do three layers of wash, and then basically three layers of color. I, I really only use the primaries. Uh, my color watercolor set, this is it. And okay. I don't even use all of these colors because I'm really just using the primaries uh, mostly to keep it simple. Yeah, wow. So it's, you're doing it the same, you're doing it exactly the same way every time? Yes. Wow, that's so cool, all right. Let's go back to that sketch. And, and I do that because it takes away, I'm not, I don't have to reinvent the wheel each time. I can focus on the scene in front of me and not on, on my technique. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm looking at the sketch and I'm thinking, they're probably, you're probably doing a lot of editing as well. Like you're really simplifying and taking a lot of stuff out. Oh yes. Sometimes uh, if a building has a dozen windows, I might draw eight. Oh, okay. You still get this. I'm not drawing every single brick. Sometimes the bricks in my drawings are larger because it's I've simplified the scene. Yeah, absolutely. Doing a lot of editing. And that also lends itself to that chubby look that we were talking about. As things kind of fill out to uh, to fill up the space on the page, they might block out more uh, trivial or less interesting details. Yeah, I, I love that. But I'm going to try to remember. You have to remember to to try these things, you know. Hard to remember so many things. All right, so exciting. What are these lovely sketches I'm looking at? So after 14 years in the classroom, I was getting a little bit restless. My son finished high school, which made me feel like I had some freedom. So I sold everything I owned, sold my house, gave away all my possessions, and moved to China to uh, draw. Really, I was there to draw, but my official capacity was as an oral English teacher. Yeah. So I taught at a college, but really I just was looking forward each day to go out and, and draw. So these are just some of the scenes that I saw on my daily walks. Wow, so cool. And what a great way to document it. Actually, that's how Danny Gregory saw my work. I was posting those drawings on Flickr and he was putting together a book called An Illustrated Journey. Yeah. He saw my China drawings and asked if I would contribute a chapter uh, to, that's this book. Uh, yeah. An illustrated journey. Yeah. So that was my first publication, and that gave me the confidence to go on and then uh, self-publish my own books. That's super. And so this was not your first book, right? Did I get no, this is my first book published by a, a professional publisher. This was published by Monticelli Press in New York. Uh, they, I sent them a proposal, and they liked it. And so I worked with an editor just to make sure that my thoughts were coherent, but the rest of it was, uh, it's just all my illustrations. It's basically my, my gauge class in book form. Cool, so cool. I, I have that one here. That's the one I have. I love it. Okay. And then so, is this the next one or? No, this is a more recent book. I went to uh, After China, that was such a, a successful trip for me in terms of developing my style and my confidence as, as an artist, that I put out the feeler that I wanted to go, uh, actually I was gonna go to Ireland at first, uh, but the accommodations that I had fell through, the person ended up, wasn't gonna be there. And so somebody in Norway, a fan of my drawings, said I could stay with them in Oslo. 
And so I spent a month sketching in Oslo. And then on the way home, I went to England. I stopped by uh, Germany. And so when I came home, I had another year's worth of drawings. And that resulted in this book about a year. Wow. That's that, great. That cover is, uh, that's a, uh, a used, like an antique store in Oslo. And I drew this through the window of a coffee shop uh, across the street. Excellent. And all of your books are available on Amazon. Is that right? Uh, they're available on Amazon, but I prefer you get them through Etsy because uh, Bezos okay. has enough money. So uh, Etsy.com <laughs> is, is the best place to get them. Okay, super. This was my first self-published book and Gabby Campanario and Danny Gregory were both kind enough to uh, write blurbs for the back and to promote them on their sites. And it was the first book I put together and so I didn't know how to restrain myself. So it's 300 pages long. It's a massive heavy thing um, that kind of covers all the way back to high school and college, all the way up to the present. It's got oil paintings, it's got graphic novel entries, it has urban sketches, um, it has very personal drawings. It's, it's very eclectic. Wow. But it's, it's, it's big, yeah, it's almost 300 pages. That's amazing. And then this is actually the third book that I, this one's all black and white. And as I mentioned before, this is the one where I do sometimes use solid black, as you can see in the cover, yeah. uh, the sky and some of the shadows. It's a much more graphic novel uh, kind of approach. Also very personal. There's a lot of like relationship anecdotes in there. Um, I held nothing back. It's very candid. That was kind of my challenge to myself is just put it out there like a diary. It's so cool. And do we have some interior pages of these books uh, in the images that you gave yes, me? Yes, 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 we do. Okay, cool. Uh, this was actually the second book, and this one is almost entirely uh, color and um, graphic novel anecdotes from my past, memories and dreams. I lived in my car for a brief period while I was in college because I didn't have any money. I couldn't afford rent, but I really wanted to finish my degree, so I'm literally putting a board on my steering wheel and doing my homework and sleeping in a sleeping bag in the front seat. So stories like that are illustrated in comic book form throughout this book. But there are also urban sketches and um, traditional interiors and exteriors. It's, it's also very eclectic, but it's heavy on the, uh, the graphic novel format. Yeah, a cool story. Good for you, Stephen. So those are the four, the four self-published books I did up until uh, the last two that I just showed you. Okay, cool. All right. So this is uh, one of the things that the classes that I teach at the Gage Academy, because it's hard to take a group of a dozen people on location, especially now you can't do it with COVID. But even before that, trying to fit a dozen people into a coffee shop or have everybody clustered around you on location is difficult. And so we use the still life to teach the technique. So even though it doesn't look like an urban sketch, it still uses the three layers of ink wash, the three layers of watercolor. And I have hundreds of these objects that I buy at Goodwill or Value Village. And the students just pick through and put a dozen of them on a table in front of them. And then we just work together through how to draw the still life. The technique is exactly the same though with the three washes and then the watercolor. Cool. This is looking really a bit similar to the demo that you're going to do. Yeah, you'll see how this is done here in just a few minutes. Here's a, a dream that I had as a teacher. Um, I had some anxiety dreams about being responsible for 30 little kids and uh, trying to keep them all on task like herding cats. And so I think I had a, a bit of an anxiety dream where I was the pilot of an airplane, but I didn't know how to fly. And this little girl gets on, the plane kind of morphs into a bus situation and it's just about the uh, the anxiety of the responsibility of being a, a teacher so I just I woke up and I thought oh that'll be a, a good couple of pages for my journal so I just illustrated the dream as faithfully as I could remember it. Mm -hmm. So cool I, I'm so excited to see the demo. Uh. It, here, here's another graphic novel entry this one is a memory of my little brother and I uh, on Friday nights, we were allowed to sleep in sleeping bags in the living room and stay up late watching old B horror movies. Um, it's just about an incident where my brother had a bee in a sleeping bag and it stung him <laughs> right during the scary part of a movie and freaked us out. So it's 
<laughs> just, just things that occur to me. Oh my gosh, that's funny. This is an interior of TNT Taqueria. My girlfriend and I had dinner there, and when we were done, I was drawn to all of those uh, color tiles. And so I just, we stayed a little bit later and I drew the room and it was very gratifying. They saw this posted online and sent me a, a, a gift card for, they actually owned several different restaurants. And they said, hey, can we use it on our Facebook banner? And I said, sure. And they sent me a, a gift card for several meals out. So it was a nice unanticipated uh, consequence of drawing on location. That's so cool. Oh, so keeping with the the personal nature of my drawings another thing that i think can be inspiring for people the earlier question about how do you find prompts what keeps you motivated um again i just try to keep it as personal as i can and this is my uh, girlfriend had an operation and so while she was recovering in the hospital i wanted to uh, sit with her and keep her company and so um, i would sit there and sketch this is the room you can see the geometry clutter in the background that attracted me and um, and so it's a nice way to you know I can talk and draw at the same time and I'm fortunate that she is also an artist and so we will often go out together and uh, sketch and hang out it's a nice way to spend time with with the people you love if they're sketchers that's nice that's very nice this is the front and back cover of my latest book it's called leap year journal because on my birthday in 2019 I challenged myself to complete a full nine by 12 inch page a day for an entire year. And it was a leap year, so it's 366 drawings. Um, and I just put it out in chronological order. So every day I did a drawing and that's basically what the book is. So this is another big hefty, almost 300 pages. And the reason it's not 366 pages is because for Inktober, I did half size pages. I did the prompts. Uh, as half size pages, so it's a little under 300 pages. Uh, cool. So this is the book, and as you can see, there's very little white space. It's each page is very crowded and dense with detail, which to me made the challenge authentic, because I did not give myself any shortcuts. There was no escape from. Uh, my girlfriend was very happy when the challenge was over, because this was all consuming for about a year. <laughs> Wow, it's so it's very polished looking, Stephen. And I think you know if you're sketching every day, you're going to start to see that polish in your sketches. Is that true? Yeah. Students will often ask me, "How do you cultivate a style?" And I say, "You know, I don't think it's something you should try to do consciously. Just draw, try to capture what you're seeing the way you see it, and you can't help but develop your own unique style. The more you try to cultivate a style, the more." Uh, maybe pretentious or uh, insincere it starts to look just let style find you just just draw just draw everyday draw cool all right let's look at another sketch so this is a, a random uh, inside spread of the book that I just showed you on the left is more of a just kind of a philosophical rambling I'm not going to go in too much detail here but just sometimes you have kind of an abstract thought about you know how the world works or how relationships work and i was just trying to depict it in visual forms and then on the right is a very traditional urban sketch uh, of an interior coffee shop just before uh covid lockdown yeah cool and actually that reminds me there is a question there was a question um about from karen moore she says how have you handled sketching during the pandemic yeah, well, actually, great segue, because the two drawings that you're looking at right now were both done from my car through the windshield. Okay. So I'm still observing social distance. I'm still technically on lockdown. Um, but I just found a place I could park and drew what was in front of me. You can see the scene on the left is not something you might think, oh, look at that picturesque scene. I need to capture that. But it was what was available from my parking spot. And so, again, the goal is not to find a beautiful scene, but to just make an interesting drawing of whatever happens to be in front of you. Yeah. And, you know, I think uh, after looking at thousands and thousands of sketches by urban sketchers all around the world, that there's a real range there, isn't there? From people who are just drawing whatever is in front of them to people who have a very polished, um, you know, picturesque, 
kind of style. It's just like a perfect piece of artwork that you would frame and sell in a gallery. And there's like a, a huge range there, isn't there? Absolutely. And I would not, if, again, if anybody listening has not joined an Urban Sketchers outing, I, I cannot stress strongly enough how beneficial that is. You'll see a range of people, some people have never drawn before, sometimes people bring their kids, and then you have trained architects who are there to draw for their own pleasure outside of work. And so yeah. you, you, there's no reason to be intimidated or self-conscious about drawing. Um, there's, there's all ranges and it's super good practice for teaching you what a two hour drawing session feels like. That's right. And uh, so thank you, uh, Kate Buke has just sent a message to me saying that Urban Sketchers has a hashtag for what you call these windshield sketches. And the oh, do they? Yeah, and the hashtag is uh, hashtag USK car sketching. Thank you, Kate. Oh, okay. for, thanks, okay. Kate. I call, for I call them dashboard me. sketches, but I'll look for that. By the way, while this picture is up, something you can do that makes your drawing um, more unique and personal to your style is that building on the right was actually horizontal. Okay. So I forced myself to draw it as a vertical composition, which squished everything and made it really tall. And what that did was it pushed me away from trying to feel like I had to be accurate or representational or very specific. It forced me to make it more abstract or more fun or whimsical. So you can do it vice versa. You can take a horizontal scene, draw it as a vertical and a vertical scene and stretch it out as a horizontal. And you get some really fun distortions like this. I was just thinking that. I was thinking, he has to have squished that. And look how fun it came out. It's just really great. I, I, I love it. You know, it's fantastic. If you think of the edges of your paper as part of the composition, you'll less have these little vignette blobs right in the middle with kind of a not very inter interesting surrounding or maybe something in a corner. If you keep in mind that the pages of your sketchbook are part of the drawing and you try to fill, I think of like bread dough and I'm kneading it into the corners of the bread pan, right? I want the drawing to fill the whole page. And, uh, and so I think that makes for, for a more interesting drawing if you've used all the real estate you've got in your sketchbook. Wow, that is a really interesting way of thinking about it. That, that's fantastic. Thank you, Stephen, for sharing that. I, I never would have thought of that one. Now, these were done from photographs. As I said, I prefer not to draw from photos, but there's no way to get uh, my girlfriend and I in the same shot without using photos. So I posed and she took pictures of me, and then she posed and I took pictures of her. And then I used maybe three or four photos and collage them together to have this scene. And I did a series of about maybe eight of these domestic scenes or going for walks or camping or whatever, just to, just to memorialize our relationship. That's nice, that's so cute. So that's, the, that's the bookshelf you can see behind me. Okay, cool. Yeah, Paul Heaston does a lot of domestic scenes as well. Right. And uh, what a fantastic, it's so much better than the, you know, uh, the photo album. Um, to be able to look through drawings that were made. I, I, I love that. I think his kids are going to really love that. So a, a little comment from uh, Carla Haler. And uh, she says uh, that um, your last sketch, I think, is reminding her quite a bit of what James Gurney and Merrick Finette talk about with their sketchbook sketching. Are you familiar hmm. with those sketchers? I, I'm not. I'll make a note of it and check them out, though. Yeah, okay. So what were their names? Um, Merrick... It was uh, James Gurney and Merrick Bennett. Okay. I'll and a question, question from Claire Putnam. She says, it must be fascinating to have so many of your life experiences and memories uh, illustrated as opposed to just in your head. I often wonder if my memories are visually accurate or distorted by time, but Stephen is lucky he has illustrated his. You know, it's funny, the last time, my parents live in Mexico, but the last time I met with them for dinner when they were up here last year, they were sharing a memory, and I said, uh, that's, that's not how that happened. There was something about when I was in high school, and they're like, oh, yes, it is. I said, well, you know, I've got a journal, a diary from that time, so there's no chance that over the decades my memory has been distorted. I, I've written it all down or drawn it. And there you go. So this is a beautiful sketch right here. Thank you. you. This was, uh, oh, we're going to see, this is the one we're going to see yeah. uh, from start to finish. So this is very similar to what we do in my classroom. 
uh, with the still life objects and you'll see in a moment how it goes from ink contours to ink washes to watercolor. And I do want to say one thing before you start the, the video, you will see at the beginning me using a pencil. And I can't stress this enough, I'm not doing a drawing. I'm drawing the basic shapes, cylinders, cones, cubes, and spheres to represent where these objects are going to go. And then when I go to ink, I'm not tracing those pencil lines. You'll see, if you can see it, you'll see that sometimes the ink line actually is not even close to where those guide lines were. It's not a drawing. Yeah. It's just setting the, oh, there's something here, there's a cylindrical thing here, there's a spherical shape down here, and that's really all it is. If during the drawing process I realize, oh, you know what, I want to move this thing over, then I just move it. I yeah. don't feel beholden to the actual scene in front of me. Okay, so uh, I don't want to interrupt you um, during your demo, so I just want to ask now, what are the actual materials that you're using to create this finished sketch? Again, Urban Sketchers has taught me that I want to be simple and portable. Everything that I want with me fits in my pocket. Uh, my pencils for the opening stage, you can see they don't even have erasers. Yeah. It's just any pencil at all. If I forget a pencil, I can borrow one. No big deal. The pen is the Uniball Vision. This is the workhorse of my technique. It's just the ballpoint. It's not super fancy, but the ink is waterproof. Super okay. important that whatever you do your contour lines is waterproof because you're going to be putting wet media on top of it. Brushes I'm not particular about. Don't buy super cheap ones because you'll just end up fighting with them, but you don't need to spend a fortune on those. Um, I just use mid-range round brushes, sixes, eights, tens, whatever. And then the watercolor kit is just this um, Windsor Newton field yeah. Look, it's only 12 colors, and as I mentioned, I don't even use these 12 colors. I use the primaries almost exclusively. Um, and the sketchbook. Oh, and then the other thing is I do carry around my ink washes pre-mixed. Yeah. So I'm not having to struggle with that on location. So I just buy these little glass jars. That one's labeled W for water. This is my light gray, and then I have a dark gray. Okay. And, and so what I just carry those with me. And what is the brand of ink, Stephen? Um, oh, that's a really good question. I like, this ink is designed for technical pens. So it's very opaque, it's waterproof, and it also comes with this handy eyedropper top so that once I mix my solutions and I use this up, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I know I want seven drops of ink into one glass of water, and that's how much my light wash is. Same in the, in the dark wash, but I only use half as much water, so that's twice as dark. Okay. Um, so, so again, they come in a bottle like this. They're designed for technical pens. This is Rapidograph. I think Koinor and Statler Mars use the same bottles, but it's really handy to have this eyedropper top so that I can count out exactly how much ink I want to use. Wow, so cool. Um, let me just see if I have another question here. While you're looking for that, anybody who wants more specific information on how to mix these, if you go to stephenready.com and go to my blog, I step-by-step -step go through exactly how I mix my, my washes if you want to follow along. That's stephenready.com. And are you using just a regular paintbrush for the ink washes? Yep. Yeah. I, I use one brush for everything. Ink washes, oh. watercolor. Because the ink is so diluted, and I use so little watercolor, it doesn't damage the brushes. I don't even wash these. I just rinse them out in the water when I'm done, throw them in my bag, and they literally last years. Uh, they've been to China and back, and I, I replace them every other year or so. They, they yeah. last forever. Yeah, and it's, I'm sorry, you probably said this, but is the water, is the um, ink wash water soluble or is it permanent ink? It's permanent ink. It has to be because when you put the watercolor on top, yeah. You don't want to reanimate that gray layer. Yeah. So it's, it's perfectly uh, waterproof. Okay. So let's uh, go to your demo then. So when I'm making, I have to start with the foreground object mm -hmm. because I can't draw something that's hidden by another object. So I start with the closest object. That becomes a reference point for the objects that are around it. So that kind of helps. There's a lot of distortions. A lot of uh, the perspective is off. 
but I still kind of use what I've already drawn to think, okay, this object is directly behind that object or just to the right or at a 45 degree angle. So each object becomes a reference point for the next object. Mm -hmm. And I, I love how you have, uh, once again, you've got these sort of puffy or sort of fatter, rounded out um, uh, objects, which makes them so much more charming than the actual objects. And, well, uh, I also have to leave myself room for the ink wash shading and the color. For instance, if you're drawing strings or wires or very thin things, you don't have any room inside to apply your tones and your colors. So it helps to make things fatter to give, to give you some wiggle room. Yeah, I love watching this part. Oh my gosh, so fascinating. I never actually apply uh, values in this way myself personally, and I'm definitely gonna try this. This looks so, so fun. So as I mentioned, the first application of ink wash is not about shadows and isolating. See the shiny highlights on the bottle and on the corkscrew? That first layer is just to isolate all of those white shiny areas because in the end, they'll give contrast to your drawing. The yeah. second and third applications of wash are where I'm looking at shadows and dark recesses and concavities and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So great, Stephen. I love it. I, I, I just can't. Something you can do to help yourself see the scene in black and white is squint. Sometimes I literally squint my eyes so I can barely see. The other thing I do is I've got a red, sorry I don't have it with me, a red plastic, it's like a mylar filter that you might use in a theater to make a red light. If you look through that, it eliminates the color and turns your scene into a black and white drawing, but I've done it enough now where I can just kind of see it in black and white, but it's very helpful initially to have some kind of a device like that. Yeah, so by the time it gets to this stage, before you've added the color, it almost, it looks like you, like you don't even need the color. The color is and, just... And some of my books have drawings that I just stop at that point because I feel like I've done my job, but, uh, but color's fun too. It just takes a little longer. Yeah. Also, you'll notice I work over the entire painting at the same time. I don't finish one object because I don't want to have to go and remix that color again later. So once I've got a color made up, I look for everywhere in the scene I can apply that color and be done with it. Again, Urban Sketchers has taught me I want to be done in a couple hours. So anything I can do to speed up the process, like using a color once and then being done with it really helps. Now here I'm hatching. Mm -hmm. doing the fine little hatch lines. This is Paul Heaston's forte. Yeah. He'll do entire drawings with hatching. Yeah. I use it more as an accent. Just to, It's like putting the eyelashes on a portrait. Yeah, yeah. And it gives it uh, that sort of, well, in your case, like a really cartoony kind of feel. Yeah, and I, and I don't mind that. I don't take umbrage when people say my drawing looks cartoony. I find that appealing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. That was just really awesome. I really enjoyed sure. that a lot. I you bet. If, if there are any more questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I think uh, as a teacher, I've learned that that's one of the best ways to make sure people are getting the info that they want if, if you have questions. Ask yeah, away. that was fantastic. Um, so uh, people are just saying thank you uh, oh, now sure. for, for the demo. I'm definitely going to go back and watch that demo again once it gets posted on the Studio 56 for Creatives YouTube channel um, because I think you can really learn a lot when you're watching somebody. You're just watching them do that whole thing. Like, oh my gosh, that was fantastic. I really And I do want to remind people that some of my books have uh, demos and step-by-step -step processes. So at Etsy.com is the best way to... Uh, to find my books. Yeah, and do they look up Stephen B. Ready? Yeah, it's actually etsy.com slash shop slash Stephen Ready. But if you just go to etsy.com and search for my name, you'll, you'll see it. Okay, do they need the B in Stephen B. Ready? No. No, and what does the B stand for? That's my middle initial, Barnard, B-A-R-N-A-R-D is my middle initial. Okay. Um, but I thought, it, when I was younger, I thought it made a sentence like Johnny B. Good, Steve Yeah, B. yeah, totally. It does. Be easy to remember. 
<laughs> it is. Um, so I have a question for you from, um, or just a, just a comment from Carla that she says, I love the ink wash to start. I never thought to do it that way before. And neither did I. I, I was oh, really blown away when I saw the demo the first time. Great. I hope it helps. So cool. Well, thank you everybody for coming to our live streaming chat today. I have uh, the next live streaming chat is coming up on August 31st. I'm going to be talking to a world renowned watercolorist, Hazel Sloan. And uh, she's the author of Learn to Paint Quickly and about 15 other books. And she is from London. Um, she's located in Cape Town right now. And thank you, Stephen, so much for chatting with us today. Thanks, do everybody. Any, do you have any uh, final comments? Uh, just, I want to encourage people to drop the preconceived notions that your drawing has to look a certain way. It's your drawing. You can't help but make it a personal drawing. Um, the best thing about being self-taught is you're not imitating. You're not going to be lumped in with somebody else whose work looks very much like yours. And just draw every day as if nobody's watching. They say <laughs> dance like nobody's watching. Draw like nobody's ever going to see you. Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. Really good advice. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Hope you have a wonderful day, and we'll see you soon. Take care. Hey, YouTube Bunnies. If you enjoyed our live streaming interview and demo with Stephen Reddy, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. You can do that by clicking on the red subscribe button right here. 